For many people, the great vaulting sky is a symbol of freedom. Seen from the distance above, life can seem peaceful. But when disaster comes from the sky, the consequences are deadly, changing lives forever. Nineteen sixty-eight, Bradford, Pennsylvania is a thriving community surrounded by rugged beauty, forests, rivers, and valleys. Most of the area around here is uh, woods. We're part of the Allegheny National Forest. There's a lot of private wooded areas around here. Located 300 kilometers northeast of Pittsburgh, Bradford, Pennsylvania is a prosperous city. Industry and energy resources fuel this community and provide a stable environment for the many families that call Bradford home. Well, for me, Bradford in the 60s was uh, a booming town. It was uh, very uh, exciting. It, we had a lot of industry here. We had a lot of factories going on. The population was doubled what it is right now. In 1968, Bradford is also a busy center for air travel. Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 is a passenger flight from Detroit, Michigan to Washington, D.C., with stops in Erie, Bradford, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Flight 736 is serviced by the reliable Convair 580. It was a very nice airplane. It was high powered, had a good power to weight ratio. Our pilots really liked it. On the night of December 24th, 1968, Flight 736 arrives late in Erie, Pennsylvania. Passengers board quickly, anxious to get on with their Christmas holiday travel. Susan Wyand is one of the passengers on Flight 736. A secretary at St. Vincent's Health Center in Erie, Susan has booked one of the last possible flights in order to meet her family for Christmas in Washington, D.C. Our family was trying to get together for Christmas. My oldest brother and his wife lived in Washington, D.C., and my parents had already gone down to visit them uh, because they had a new baby, and I was to be godmother to that baby on Christmas Eve. Also on board is Dr. Frederick Dankmeyer, a resident eye specialist at the Mayo Clinic. He is rushing to the side of his mother, who has just suffered a heart attack. Flight attendant Rita Boylan ensures that passengers are comfortable before the airplane departs. One couple traveling with their two teenage children were separated. She and her daughter were asked to move to a different part of the plane for balance. They were an eerie family. For young Kathy Angel and her family, a simple change in seating arrangements will prove to be life-altering. In the cockpit of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 is experienced pilot Captain Gary Lee and his co-pilot, First Officer Richard Bruce Gardner. I remember looking out the window before takeoff as we were taxiing down the runway and the snow was so intense that it was hard to see the light at the end of the wing. I guess I was in an age of innocence thinking, gee, isn't it amazing that they can fly in this kind of weather? 
50 minutes behind schedule. At approximately 7.46 p.m., Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 departs Erie, Pennsylvania for Bradford. 47 people on board. In the destination city of Bradford, Pennsylvania, Christmas celebrations are well underway. Roy Compton, a member of the Mount Jewett Volunteer Fire Department, takes his family to visit his mother and father at their home not far from the Bradford Airport. While we were there, it was snowing real hard and things, and I told my wife we should go home because the roads are getting bad. As Flight 736 nears the Bradford Airport, Captain Lee and First Officer Gardner prepare to perform a standard but relatively outdated VOR approach. This type of approach uses a radio beacon to locate the airport. You fly over the radio beacon. Uh, there's a needle which will swing around as you pass over the beacon, so you know exactly where you are. When you're over that beacon, you do what is called a procedure turn. You fly outbound away from the airport over this beacon, uh, do a turn so that you turn inbound and you pass a second time then over the beacon headed directly for the airport. In order to descend safely to the runway, the pilot must follow a prescribed approach plate, usually while keeping a visual watch on the ground. That approach plate will give directions, it'll give headings that you're to fly, and it'll also give altitudes. And it will give an MDA, a minimum descent altitude, which you're not supposed to go below. On Christmas Eve, 1968, the landing at the Bradford Airport will prove anything but normal for the passengers and crew of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736. On Christmas Eve, 1968, Allegheny Airlines Flight 736, carrying 47 passengers and crew, prepares to make a standard VOR approach to the Bradford, Pennsylvania airport. At approximately 8 p.m., just 15 minutes after leaving Erie, Flight 736 picks up the signal from the VOR beacon at the Bradford airport. At 8.06 p.m., the flight crew contacts the Bradford Flight Service Station. They are informed of the weather conditions. Light blowing snow, winds 24 kilometers an hour, gusting to 40. Visibility is less than one kilometer to just over two kilometers. As the plane prepares for its final approach to Bradford, Roy Compton and his mother hear what they believe to be Flight 736 overhead. My mother, she knows these airplanes. They go out and they make a turn and then they come back. We actually heard it when it come back. And she said, that plane sounds awful funny to me. I don't know why it did, but it just sounded something different to it. High above them, flight attendant Rita Boylan starts to prepare the passengers for landing. The flight went on as normal until we were approaching Bradford and the announcement was made to buckle your seat belts. We were on final approach and that the plane would be landing shortly. While Captain Lee and First Officer Gardner attempt to get a visual fix on the runway, they inadvertently descend below their minimum descent altitude. Neither the flight crew nor the passengers of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 are aware that the aircraft is rushing towards the ground. It seemed as though the plane may have circled the airport a couple times. In order to help sight the runway, the pilot turns on the airplane's landing lights. At 8.11 p.m., Captain Lee indicates that he can't see the runway. Suddenly, both he and his co-pilot hear a loud thump. First Officer Gardner tells Lee to pull up. There was turbulence, and all of a sudden, there was a loud ripping sound. I looked out, and I could see the wing was gone. And then there was like electricity or, or sparks flying through the cabin. 
Flight 736 clips a tree in the heavily wooded area near the runway. First, the left wing and then the right are sheared from the plane as it tumbles, cutting an 800-foot swath through trees and saplings. The plane lands upside down in snow-covered swampland. The impact has ripped the plane open from just below the windshield to the top of the rear cabin door. I remember regaining consciousness and I was having problems breathing and I tried to lift a hand to, to clear something away from my nose. And I tried to scream and all that would come out was like a moan. The flight service station at Bradford Airport realizes that Flight 736 is not on the runway where it should be. When the airplane crashed, no one was really certain that it had crashed. After failed attempts by both Erie Approach Control and the Bradford Flight Service Station to contact Flight 736, a search and rescue mission is called. Meanwhile, the survivors of the crash are doing their best to stay alive. It's my understanding they used whatever they could find, pillows, luggage, to build this fire because it was very, very cold. I understand it was four degrees Fahrenheit outside and still snowing. The search and rescue effort is hampered by the fact that no one knows the exact location of the crash site. Fortunately, help soon comes from above. It was about a half hour later when another flight uh, approaching the airport saw the fire and reported it to air traffic control and they directed the, uh, the searchers in to the site. Roy Compton, volunteer at the Mount Jewett Fire Department, leaves his family on Christmas Eve to join the rescue effort. It was snowing and very, very cold. We were actually plowing snow with a fire truck and was driving up an old railroad grade down there and happened to spot a little twinkle of light down in like a swampy area. There was like probably eight or 10 people around a big bonfire in the middle of a swamp down there. Roy, along with other volunteers and a local doctor, arrived to find the horrific wreckage of Flight 736 and start the search for survivors. The earth was shoved up inside the plane. I crawled up in the space where I could get up in and I grabbed on to a person's leg and it was loose and I immediately let go of it. It scared me to death. First person I came to was a, a lady that was upside down in her seat, hollering, screaming, get my baby, get my baby. Dr. Sicker from Kieran Kane showed up, stuck his finger in the baby's mouth, the baby bit him, so he said the baby was all right. The baby was laying on her lap, so she actually protected it. The baby didn't get hurt at all. We walked around the front of the plane. There was a stewardess hanging out the front of the plane. And they told her, said, just relax. We'll have you out of there in a minute. And she said, don't worry about me. Get the other people. Flight attendant Rita Boylan escapes the crash without serious injury. Others are not so fortunate. There was a lady lying upside down, strapped in her seat, completely flipped over. Her head was buried in the dirt. I literally dug the snow and stuff out away from her face with my bare hands so she could breathe. I could hear people screaming in there. So I crawled in and I found him. It was Dr. Dakmer. He had a piece, piece of metal sticking out of his eye. And he's probably a third of the way covered in dirt. I'm trying to dig it off him. I'm trying to pull him out and I can't pull him. As John and other rescuers dig out Dr. Dankmeyer, they discover that he is pinned down by the legs of a dead body. Had to break this guy's legs that were wrapped around Dr. Dakmeyer in order to get Dr. Dakmeyer out. We got him out, they hauled him away. As difficult as it is to locate and remove survivors from the wreckage, the challenge now facing rescuers is transporting the wounded across boggy terrain in the driving snow to the safety of nearby hospitals. And time is running out. 
Christmas Eve, 1968. Rescuers at the crash site of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 face the challenges of getting the injured to medical help. Because Flight 736 has crashed in rugged terrain, the rescuers must improvise a method of moving the survivors from the wreckage to waiting ambulances. Well, we had a lot of snowmobiles come in. The only way we'd get to them was snowmobiles with little sleds on the back were hauling people out to the highway so we'd get them out to the ambulance and stuff. We didn't know what to expect. We had no idea what the, the, this plane had gone through or what it had done, flipping over and, and losing a wing. We just knew it was a plane wreck, so we just went to, to help. There was a lady at my feet on a cot. Her face was blackened uh, from the jet fuel, from dirt. I just grabbed on one of the, the legs of the cot. I remember uh, trying to get through these swamp holes and falling in them. I would fall in one and we'd lose balance and then someone else on one of the legs would fall in one. And finally we got her to the railroad grade. Susan Wyand, still trapped in her seat, is helped by one of the rescuers. The gentleman came back and uh, tried to pull me out by reaching under my arms and tugging. He was uh, unable to move me and realized that the seatbelt was still fastened. And he reached down and unfastened the seatbelt and, and they pulled me out by my shoulders. Uh, the next thing I remember was becoming conscious, I guess, around the fire that survivors had built. I was tied to a toboggan which was hitched to a snowmobile and taken out of the uh, area to an ambulance that was waiting on the road. I remember hearing um, one of the rescue workers say, I think we ought to take the kids first. And I thought, I hope they think I'm a kid. <laughs> Susan clings to life as she's rushed to the hospital. I have no recollection of arriving at the hospital. Uh, the doctor who treated me said that I was not breathing, but I did have faint heart sounds. And they uh, resuscitated me. Susan suffers four broken vertebrae, 10 broken ribs, a broken hand, fractured teeth, and internal injuries. Still in the wreckage, John Reimer helps pull Kathy Angel to short-lived safety. It was Kathy Angel, she was 14 years old, took her out. I remember the doctor said, now put her on that cutter and take it nice and easy, she's got a broken neck. Well, she never made it, she died up in the Hammond Hospital. Like most of the passengers seated in the front of the plane, Kathy and her mother die as a result of the injuries sustained in the crash. Sitting in the rear, Mr. Angel and his son survive. For them, Christmas will forever serve as a reminder of their loss. Christmas morning, 1968, reveals the full extent of the tragedy. The crash of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 claims the lives of 20 people including Captain Gary Lee and First Officer Richard Bruce Gardner. Miraculously, 27 people survive, including Susan Wyand, whose rehabilitation from her many injuries eventually returns her to a normal life. We would have lost several more, probably, in this plane crash. But that happened on Christmas Eve of all times. Uh, somebody was looking out for them the people that survived, that's my opinion. The National Transportation Safety Board immediately launches an investigation into the crash of Flight 736, never suspecting that the Bradford Airport would be the center of yet another tragedy. Just 13 days later, on January 6, 1969, Allegheny Airlines Flight 737, bound from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, crashes short of the runway near the Bradford Airport. 
While 25 people survive, 11 lose their lives. I found it very ironic that, that a similar accident happened two weeks later and extremely coincidental. Uh, but I think it was both accidents were caused by the same effect. Uh, it was unbelievable that a second one in that short a time happened. Uh, uh, it, it made Bradford famous, two plane wrecks in, in that short a period of time. More than a year later, the crash report for Flight 736 delivers a probable cause. The airplane flew through the minimum descent altitude because the flight crew members were attempting to make visual references to the ground. I mean, if you read the NTSB report, it says the cause of the accident is the, the pilots flew the airplane into the ground. There must be some reason why they did that. And the only reason I can see is you make an instrument approach. The minute you get any ground contact, see something, you tend to break off the approach on instruments. And from there on, you fly it visually. As a result of the investigation, the Bradford Airport installs an instrument landing system, or ILS. The ILS system consists of a radio beam going up at about a three degree angle. It's very narrow, both up and down and left and right. This narrow radio beam guides the aircraft all the way to the ground. I've done it many times and it's really a great feeling when you can't see a thing and suddenly you break out of the fog and the clouds and there's a runway right in front of you. It's a very precise, exact approach. Experts agree that an instrument landing system would have prevented the crash of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736. I think that if they had had the instrument landing system at the time of these accidents, these accidents would never have happened because they would have flown that beam right down to the runway and they would not have gotten close to the ground. There is no memorial to those who lost their lives, but rescuers, survivors, and the loved ones of those who died can never forget the events of Christmas Eve, 1968. To this day, I can remember that baby crying and those gentlemen going at that plane, trying to get into that plane. My thoughts are mostly with those who didn't make it and how that must have torn their families apart that Christmas and every Christmas to follow. Twelve years earlier, and thousands of kilometers north in the Canadian Arctic, an RCAF transport plane takes off for Montreal. A flight plan has been filed, but it never reaches Air Defense Command in charge of protecting northern skies against the threat of Soviet invasion. This flight will set in motion a series of events that will also bring tragedy from above. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956. 11 kilometers east of Ottawa, in the tiny village of Orleans, Ontario, it is just another day. The largest building in Orleans is the Villa Saint-Louis, near the banks of the Ottawa River. It serves as a retreat and rest home for the Sisters of Charity, an order commonly known as the Grey Nuns. Uh, the Villa Saint Louis was a beautiful building that was facing the river. Uh, nuns that were, had been sick or operated or something like that, they went there to rest. It was close from the river. And every week, uh, nuns came down for, say, for our holidays. The Villa's resident chaplain is 43-year-old Father Richard Ward. Since his arrival, he has struck a chord not only with the sisters of the convent, but with their neighbors, particularly the Potvan family. That priest was a special man. Nearly once a week, he stopped at the farm. At that time, my dad was managing the farm, putting it right under the cross. The Potvans all live in homes on the San Louis farm. Today, Joe Potvan and his children 
are on their way to fish in the river when they meet one of the nuns from the villa. The sister seems unusually nervous. Uh, she told me, Joe, it's funny. I feel funny today. But she took my hand and said, Joe, don't go to the river. You go back home. My oldest uh, son, Daniel, said, Dad, we're going to fish. We're going to fish. Never mind the nuns. <laughs> Many of the convent residents are elderly, and some are recuperating from surgery. Others are quite young, just beginning their lifelong service to God. Sister Andre Bernard is just 22 and has yet to pronounce her perpetual vows. She works at the infirmary at the Order's Mother House in Ottawa with Sister Erne. Oh yes, I knew most of them because uh, uh, we had four of the younger ones there that uh, were helping us during the summer. And uh, those younger ones had gone for their holidays in uh, New Orleans. Sister Ernay's aunt, Sister Saint Croix, is also spending holiday time at the villa. She is joined by 27-year-old Sister Matai de la Croix, who has just returned from service in New England. Sister Laura Barbeau is a student nurse at Ottawa General, owned and operated by the Grey Nuns. She is looking forward to spending time at the Villa Saint Louis. We had uh, three months of classes and then three months on, on duty. And uh, we were scheduled uh, to leave that evening for uh, our uh, two-week vacation at the villa. At the last minute, however, the trip is postponed until the following morning. Uh, the rector of the uh, La Salle Academy came and uh, asked our superior uh, of the time if uh, we would like to um, have the, the young men from the uh, academy come to give us a play at the hospital. And as we were going on vacation anyway, well, we said yes. For Laura Barbeau, it will be one of the most important decisions of her life. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956, 9.30 p.m. A four-engine RCAF North Star approaches Montreal. It has been filing position reports every half hour since leaving the Canadian Arctic earlier in the afternoon. None of these reports have reached the 445th Squadron monitoring the skies from CFB uplands near Ottawa. The spread of communism in the decades since World War II has been seen as a real threat to Western nations Canada included. Like squadrons across the country, the 445th is on 24-hour alert, with two of its new CF-100 fighters ready to take off at a moment's notice. The CF-100, it was the first fighter built in Canada and designed by Canada. The CF-100 was uh, an air defense interceptor to protect against the threat of uh, Soviet bombers coming across the north. At 9.30 p.m., CFB Uplands detects the North Star transport on its radar. Unaware of its flight plan, ground control cannot identify the aircraft and immediately orders its two standby CF-100s into action. Firstly, we'd have to identify it if we thought it necessary. If it wasn't necessary, it was our job to shoot it down. One of the fighters is piloted by 25-year-old flying officer Bill Schmidt. 20-year-old Ken Thomas is his navigator. Ken Thomas, he was what people would like to think of as typical boy next door. A really, really nice kid. He was engaged to be married within a couple of months. Within minutes, the two RCAF fighters intercept the unidentified aircraft. 
ground control is relieved when it turns out to be one of their own. One of the CF-100s returns to base. Bill Schmidt and Ken Thomas report that they have excess fuel, which they need to burn off before landing. It is the last transmission they will ever send. It's always better to burn off some fuel before you land. It makes the landing much easier when you don't have a full load of fuel on board. It seemed routine initially, and then the, the radar ground-controlled uh, PCI operator lost radio contact with them. There was no uh, warning calls or any indication that there was any aircraft malfunction prior to that, the aircraft disappearing off the radars. It is 10.15 p.m. Like most of the residents of the Villa Saint Louis, Sister Louis Auguste is in bed. She is a former mother superior who has been convalescing at the convent for the last eight months. Father Richard Ward is still up. He hears an unusual sound outside that he recognizes as the whine of an aircraft approaching very quickly. Traveling at over 1,100 kilometers per hour, the CF-100 rams through the chapel adjoining the convent, then slams into the main building. There is only an instant between the initial crash and the horrible explosion that envelops the villa. In that instant, Father Richard Ward calls out to the sisters, trying to warn them. The shock of the explosion is felt all over Orleans. All of a sudden, there was one hell of a bang. Everything in the kitchen, the glasswork, that all broke the hell. Yeah, I found this every year. And I heard the noise and went to the window to look at the flames. We thought it crashed in the field. We didn't know. We were looking at the fire and we were hearing people yelling. We thought it was in the forest. You could see from the farm, my house, maybe a mile from my house. It was red all over. By a cruel stroke of fate, the aircraft hits the only building of any size in the small community. Around it are open fields and forest. Now, that building is a blazing inferno, and its residents are still inside, some too old or too sick to escape on their own. Tuesday, May 15th, 1956. Just after 10.15 p.m., a CF-100 fighter jet on a routine mission smashes into the Villa Saint Louis, a retreat for the Order of Grey Nuns. Inside the building, Sister Louis Auguste's world erupts around her. At first, I thought it was a bomb. I think everyone on the top floor must have been burned. Many on the ground floor were also unable to get out. I just had time to run to the aid of some of my companions, some of whom were invalids. Helped by another sister, I transported one of the sisters to the exit. Blinded by the thick smoke, the nuns can only feel their way along the walls, searching for escape. Some of them were not well and uh, probably had taken medication also before they went to bed. Uh, so the others went to try to wake them up. Outside, neighbors hurry to the villa to help. Rayal Rainville and his brother-in-law, Lawrence Barber, are among the first to arrive. There was no fire escape or nothing like that. So we tried the back door and uh, there's no way, it was lock solid. So that's when somebody got on uh, uh, Lawrence Barber's uh, shoulders and he, he managed to break the window, went in and opened the door for us. The men begin pulling terrified nuns from the building. 
One of them is Sister Saint Croix. My aunt, she had tried to uh, take the corridor, but when she opened the door, she burned her hand on the doorknob, and then she went to the window, but there was a screen. She couldn't get out by herself, so the men just got one on top of the other and put her out. She had burn on her hand, on her arm, and her face, but besides that, she was okay. Some of them were heard banging on the doors upstairs. The door upstairs must have been locked. And we could hear them scream, something awful. One of those calling for help is Sister Marie de Martyr, trapped near her third floor window. I kept yelling, break the screen, break the screen. And uh, she finally broke, it fell down. She put her feet out of the window, and she was sit uh, sitting like on the ledge, and then she let herself go, and she was coming down, uh, not in a sitting position, but we re ran first, you know? And uh, honest to God, when she hit me, just like being hit by a train train. Sister Louis Auguste has managed to escape the burning building. Although seriously injured, she is still more fortunate than those left inside. We saw some nuns falling inside. They didn't want to get out by the window. There were lots of people who were saying, we are going to catch you, but they didn't want to jump by the window. When I went to the front to try and get into the door, it was our only chance. It was impossible uh, anymore in the back, and uh, the fire was coming out of the front real bad. And that's when I, I saw Father Ward like about 150 feet. Uh, in front of the building on his stomach. I thought it was one of the pilots at first. Several men answer Rayal's cries for help, including Wilfred and Joe Potvan. We brought him near the river, and he passed away maybe two minutes after. I looked, I took him, he died in my arms. You always think that you, you can go into another door or something like that to try and get the, the rest of them out. And when you know that you can't do anything anymore, that's what hurts. The men have rescued 25 of the 37 people in the building. Most of the survivors are in nightgowns and bare feet. A couple of them were walking. And some of them had passed out by the heat. Some of them were badly burned on top of that. When police and firefighters arrive, there is little they can do but stand with the growing crowd of onlookers and watch the building burn. There was a big field there and a big crowd. It was terrible. They were exclaiming, ah, because the fire was so high, so high and it was so big. Among them are the Simards, sisters of one of the nuns, Matai de Lacroix. They cried a lot. They were saying, I hope my sister is not in the fire. I hope my sister is not in the fire. But unfortunately, she was there. The body of the 27-year-old nun is found in a rocking chair in her room, still holding her rosary in her hands. Some survivors are taken to Ottawa General, owned and operated by the Grey Nun Order. Student nurse Laura Barbeau, who was supposed to be at the villa that night, is part of the emergency team. Well, they were brought to in cars and in ambulances and uh, those who came here of course were those who needed some type of medical help. This was a very very uh, emotional moment for us because uh, many of our sisters uh, were severely hurt. We uh, placed them in the rooms and uh, cared for them uh, but those burns 
They were very long. It took very long to heal. They needed dressings every day. Sister Erne is also concerned about the fate of the younger nuns who worked with her at the infirmary and who were staying at the Villa Saint Louis. We were so anxious to know if they would be back. And we learned through the night that the, the, they, they were in the fire. They died. One of them, Sister Andre Bernard, never gets the chance to take her final vows. Those without physical injuries are taken to a farmhouse not far from Orleans, where Sister Eliane Lalonde lives with eight other nuns. A car arrived crowded with nuns, and one of them came in the house screaming. They were all in terrible, terrible shock. I don't think we went to bed that night. <laughs> uh, you know, even after everybody was settled in, we just uh, spent the rest of the night talking about it and um, wondering how this could all happen, how this plane happened to fall on the building was beyond our understanding because uh, it was so close to the river and there was so much space around there uh, that it was really unbelievable. The next day, the death toll is confirmed. 15 are dead. 11 nuns, the priest father Richard Ward, 40-year-old housekeeper Aline Lapointe, and the two crewmen. A few days after, when they dig uh, to find something with the airplane, I saw the wallet of the pilot. And he had his son's picture. And I saw his picture. You cannot forget this. An inquest attributes the explosion to the CF 100's substantial fuel supply at the time of the crash. The cause of the tragedy is never confirmed, but Air Force officials have a theory. We can only assume that both crew members were incapacitated. The most logical reason for that would be an oxygen failure. Nothing else would go along with the, the scenario uh, with no radio communication indicating a problem uh, and uh, neither Member, crew member getting out of the aircraft. The ruins of the Villa Saint Louis are eventually cleared. A new building is constructed in its place, not a private convent, but a public nursing home run by the Grey Nuns. In fact, a monument. They took the cross. They've made a monument with the remaining pieces of the building, the cross, the brick, and it's still there in front of the building. They did that special monument for the victims of the accident. However, those involved in the Villa Saint Louis fire and the crash of Allegheny Airlines Flight 736 don't need monuments to keep the memory of these tragedies alive. Saw the pilot, co-pilot, both deceased. A couple of stewardesses deceased. I saw uh, several of the passengers deceased. To actually experience something like that firsthand, you'll never, you better hope you never see it in your lifetime. There were 20 people on that plane that didn't make it. And I think afterwards, um, uh, there's something called survivor's guilt, where, where you question, you know, why was it not them and not me? We, we don't have an answer. You can still hear them screaming sometimes, you know? And you don't want to remember that. It, it, it's the kind of screaming that you're not going to hear, on, even on TV, you know? I don't, it's not the same thing at all. It was horrific. It was to see 
16 years old, I never saw dead bodies. It was a horrible, horrible experience. It was uh, to see that plane in that condition ripped apart and the poor people who were survived that I could see who survived, it was quite a shock. It was extremely tragic, but again, uh, in faith, you, you have to accept these things. Uh, there's a purpose for everything.